opening remarks to try to fit in as much as I can in the allotted minutes, but then we're going to have open discussion, questions and answers. Um, I, uh, this is a book that was discussed in the previous session, by the way, that I wrote about the Kellogg Briand Pact, and I have some other books of mine and of World Beyond War and some flyers from Just World Books that, is sell that are selling some other books of mine on their table, and they have this wonderful book on war and the environment that's coming out soon. Uh, and this is a conference World Beyond War is doing in September on war and the environment, bringing together peace activists and environmental activists. Uh, that I encourage you to pick up a flyer and, and consider coming to that. Um, so as, as Steve and others mentioned this morning, it is not common on Kellogg Boulevard in St. Paul, Minnesota, to find anyone who knows why it is called Kellogg Boulevard. Uh, and uh, a bunch of us are going over there with flyers on Saturday morning, and I hope you will join us. It is in your programs. Um, the, the Hiroshima event the next morning is also in your program. Uh, the Nobel Peace Prize laureate Frank Kellogg of St. Paul has his name on the treaty whose creation was probably the biggest news story of 1928. So this is not secret CIA news. This is news that's been <laughs> forgotten, left out. Uh, this is a treaty listed as in effect on the U.S. State Department's website, a treaty that bans war. Kellogg is buried in the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C., but no nobody there knows who he is either. And if he were to come back to life, I think few would know it, as he would not be permitted on corporate media. <laughs> Imagine trying to end war. What a joke. What an outrage. What an insult to our brave young men and women attacking nations around the globe, endangering us with blowback and dying first and foremost from suicide. Secretary of State Kellogg should be ashamed of himself. And yet, he bowed to nearly universal public pressure switching from cursing peace activists to advancing their demands and lying and scheming to deny that Nobel Peace Prize to a leading activist and claim it for himself. The U.S. Senate ratified his treaty 85 to 1. Senators gave speeches against it and then voted for it, explaining that they would not be allowed back in their home states if they voted it down. And it wasn't a joke. Prior to the pact, war, the conquering of territory, and most associated atrocities were legal, even understood as law enforcement. The first ever prosecutions for the crime of war following World War II were based on violation of the Peace Pact, the Kellogg-Briand Pact. For whatever combination of reasons, wealthy armed nations have not gone to war with each other since. Yet numerous wars against and among poor nations rage on in routine violation of both Kellogg-Briand and the United Nations Charter. The massive and mainstream movement of the 1920s to outlaw war is unfairly disparaged as having generally imagined that merely banning war would end it. This claim is no more fact-based than the idea that Christopher Columbus believed the earth was flat. Leading outlawists wanted war and preparations for war, including weapons dealing, ended and replaced by the rule of law, conflict prevention, dispute resolution, and moral, economic, and individual punishment and ostracism. Their project is our project should we choose to pick up the baton, and we might do so more effectively if we learn some of the lessons from their past. The outlawists' arguments were very often moral ones, in a manner much less common in today's cynical and advertising-saturated world in which activists have been conditioned to appeal only to selfish interests. The outlawists I find most inspiring often used an analogy to dueling. When we banned dueling, they said, we didn't just ban aggressive dueling. We didn't keep defensive dueling around. We banned the entire institution. And this is what they wanted done to war. Whatever you make of the wisdom or of the actual presence of defensive war thinking in the 1920s, and senators who ratified the treaty did uh, believe that it silently permitted, without defining, defensive war. It is my contention that we cannot survive defensive war thinking much longer. I believe it permits the military spending that kills first and foremost by diverting resources from human and environmental needs. Small fractions of military spending could end hunger around the world, unclean water around the world, various diseases around the world, and even the use of fossil fuels. A theoretical just war 
would have to be so just as to outweigh decades of this deadly diversion of resources, as well as all the blatantly unjust wars it has been generating, as well as the ever-increasing risk of nuclear apocalypse created by the institution of war, not to mention the damage this institution does to the natural environment, civil liberties, domestic policing, and representative government. It's a heck of a just war. So one of my books is called War is Never Just. Uh, it is uncomfortable for us to consider, but it is possible that the U.S. government has a wee bit of a war problem. A December 2013 Gallup poll in 65 countries found the United States the most common top answer to the question, what country is the greatest threat to peace in the world? And yesterday, a Pew poll found that this has increased significantly in the past four years. <laughs> During President Barack Obama's presidency, the United States used bombs or missiles on Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iraq, Syria, Somalia, Yemen, Libya, and the Philippines. This may be one of those few rooms where I could find somebody who could give me that list, but in most rooms in this country, I cannot. We cannot even keep track. Uh, in last year's Republican presidential primaries, a debate moderator asked a candidate if he would be willing to kill hundreds and thousands of innocent children as part of his basic duties, a question that created no significant scandal. <laughs> last week, controversy followed a White House announcement that henceforth it would fight on only one side of the war in Syria a war that the head of U.S. Special Operations last week said was clearly illegal for the U.S. to be in. Many Americans believe the wars somehow, in general, are inevitable. And this week, Senator Lindsey Graham, I guess the most masculine person in our country, <laughs> according to the previous session, uh, declared that a devastating war in Korea is virtually inevitable. Why? Because he'll start it. Because we must choose, he says, between regional stability in, in Asia and security of the father, I mean the homeland. Uh, <laughs> as if destroying regions of the globe makes the homeland more secure, not less secure, as of course it does. Since World War II, during what many U.S. academics think of as a golden age of peace, the United States military has killed some 20 million people overthrown at least 36 governments, interfered in at least 82 foreign elections, which is a horrible sin, by the way, I've just learned, uh, attempted to assassinate over 50 foreign leaders and dropped bombs on people in over 30 countries. Lists of these activities are on my website at davidswanson.org. The United States has stationed, has uh, so-called special forces. They are larger than most nations' militaries. They're not very special. They have special forces <laughs> operating in two-thirds of the world's countries and non-special forces stationed in three-quarters of the world's countries. The United States spends roughly as much on militarism as the rest of the world combined and possesses somewhere around 98 to 99 percent of military bases in the world that are in foreign countries. Even the Congressional Progressive Caucus budget proposal is to increase military spending, only to do so more slowly than Donald Trump's budget proposal. War has been stigmatized over the past 90 years, but only other people's wars. U.S. wars have been normalized, and abolition campaigns have been marginalized. We need to oppose each new and ongoing war with everything we have, but doing so will not be enough. As I said, we cannot even keep track of our current wars. We have to oppose the entire institution of war. It is the only thing that makes sense. You cannot support having wars at all and not support doing everything to win them. You can't accept the legalization of mass murder and somehow put an end to torture and imprisonment and <laughs> surveillance. You can't back the use of white phosphorus and napalm in wars justified as expressions of outrage at the use of anthrax and expect people who don't own television networks or sit in Congress to take you seriously. <laughs> On Sunday in the morning, a bunch of us are going, and I hope you'll come, and it's in your program, to a ceremony at the Peace Garden in Minneapolis to remember Hiroshima and Nagasaki. There is now a wonderful global movement to ban nuclear weapons that needs all of our support. But threatening North Korea and Russia and making plans to attack Iran is a great way to spread nuclear weapons. Nuclear apocalypse is a growing danger on a par with climate 
chaos, another growing danger, and will continue to grow until the war abolition movement starts to succeed. War and preparations for war are our biggest destroyers of water, air, land, and atmosphere. War kills first and foremost by removing resources from where they are needed, including from famines and disease epidemics created by war. Any activism that seeks funding for any human or environmental needs has to look to ending war. It is where all the money is. More money every single year than you could take away once and only once from the billionaires. If you don't understand that, when you tax all the billionaires' money away, they don't have any money anymore. <laughs> but when you take all the war spending away, there's another trillion coming next year, and the next year, and the next year. Uh, World Beyond War is planning a conference on the topic of how peace and environmental activists can work together. Uh, we hope for some progress on that and some collaborations coming out of this week here in Minnesota as well. War creates secrecy, surveillance, classification of public business, warrantless spying on activists, patriotic lying, and illegal actions by secret agencies. War militarizes local police, making the public into an enemy. War fuels just as it is fueled by racism, sexism, bigotry, hatred, and domestic violence. It teaches people to solve problems by shooting guns and U.S. presidents to win applause by urging the bashing of U.S. skulls. And while peace is good for the spread of democracy and war disastrous, existing so-called democracies do not bring us peace. Real democracy might. Polling has found the U.S. public to favor a roughly $41 billion reduction in military spending, an approximate $94 billion gap away from President Donald Trump's proposal of a $54 billion increase. There is little question that direct democracy would mean less war. It is worth exploring at the Democracy Convention how we can more closely approximate that outcome given the sorts of governments that we have. Thank you.